All right. Hey, everybody. Um, for those watching, um, I decided we don't have too many people here, so we'll just be running through the study guide um, as much as I can, and we'll talk about it all. So, yeah, let's go ahead and get to it. So, first problem here says to find the domain and range of the function. So, in this case, the function is 3 minus x times the square root. Or sorry, it's a, uh, well, actually, it looks like I have a mix of letters there. That's not good. Um, you can change it to just three minus X in both cases. Okay. And we want to find the domain and range. And then we want to also find, so domain, range, F of two, and F of um, three minus A if a is greater than zero. <coughs> okay, so let's go ahead and start running through this. Okay, so first thing um, that I want to mention is just the fact that um, a lot of times I saw in the quiz that people were finding domains and range for it was, we're finding domain and range for the function, but uh, then also finding domain and range for each of these values. As long as, the number works, right? If, if I can put in, um, you know, two and like three, I, can, I was like, I put three minus a, so if a is one, two um, inside this function, then it's, the those two numbers are part of the domain. They don't give me a new domain, right? There's only one domain in one range, okay? So to find the one domain of this function, let's think about this, right? So, the first piece on here doesn't really affect anything, right? I can plug anything to three minus X and it'll be fine, right? So one, two, three, negative, all the negative numbers, that's okay. The real issue comes whenever I'm dealing with the square root of three minus X, okay? Because clearly I can't plug numbers in there. As an example, if I put four in, right? That'll give us negative one, which will not, work, okay? So what needs to happen is I need three minus X to be greater than or equal to zero, okay? So if three minus X is greater than or equal to zero, <clears throat> I can solve this, right? I'll add an X to both sides, which says that three is greater than or equal to X, or maybe more properly, I can write this as x is less than or equal to three. So just uh, rewrote the equation, kind of flipped it around, okay? So in this case, whatever x is in this equation, it has to be less than or equal to three. If it's less than or equal to three, this thing works. If it's greater than three, we have a problem, okay? So the domain in this case is gonna be all numbers less than or equal to three, which we will write that as minus infinity, three, and then we will put a bracket on this side. Remember talking about anytime I'm dealing with a number and I include it, I put a bracket on it. If I'm not including it, I put a parenthesis. And anytime I have it, so I use infinity whenever I just say always less than or always greater than. In this case, it'll be minus and always put a parenthesis around it. So that'll be my domain. Okay, the range. So the range is gonna be a direct you know, come directly off of whatever's happening here, right? So let's think about this, right? Um, what happens at, at the number three, okay? So what is, what is F of three? Well, <laughs> F at three, right, is going to be three minus three times the square root of three minus three, which this is zero and this is also zero. So we just end up getting zero times zero, which is zero. Okay. Now what's gonna happen when I plug in a number less than three, right? So maybe this is a good time. Let's go ahead and talk about what F of two is gonna be. So F of two, right, let's plug that. In. F of two is going to be three minus two times the square root of three minus two, <laughs> okay? So three minus two is one 
and the square root of three minus two is square root of one. So we just get one, okay? So we already noticed that here we get zero and here we get one, right? If I plug numbers in between, right? I should be able to get other numbers I want as well, right? So for example, if I want, um, well, actually, that might be a little bit harder to, um, let's see, how do we want to do it from here? Well, actually, let's, so we have this and we have this thought. Let's also talk about f of three minus a. It's always good to talk about what happens with these sorts of terms, see what's going on, right? So if I put f of, if I use f of three minus a in here, right? <coughs> then I'm going to get, um, oh, I'll do that work. I'd be over here. There we go. So I'll move this work. Probably should have tried to structure this a bit more. That's all right. F of two equals three minus two times the square root of three minus two, which is one. Square root of one, which is one. Okay, F of three minus a is going to be equal to, right? So now I'm plugging in for x, right? So we're going to take three minus a and put it inside for the x here. So I'm going to get three minus x, which is now three minus a times the square root of three minus <coughs> three minus a, okay? So, What's going to happen? Well, I distribute this negative in each case, so I get three minus three plus a times the square root of three minus three plus a, which just gives me a times the square root of a. Okay, so that would be the answer to that part. Okay, so so far we've got the domain f of two and f of three minus a. All in a goal to try to figure out maybe what's happening with our range. Okay, so. Let's see what's happening, right? So now we have this three minus a, right? So as long as a is greater than zero, right? Then that's gonna give us a square root of a, right? And it's, we want a to be greater than zero um, because if it's not, then we clearly have a problem, right? We would get um, a negative number inside here. But this allows me to get whatever number I want um, because if I, right, so, if I want, so remember, and the, well, this comes from the discussion of uh, fractional exponents and stuff. I can rewrite this as a to the three halves power, right? We already see that from here, right? This is this is always going to be a positive number, right? So if I want any positive number, so let's say a to the three halves, and I want it to be equal to b, right? Then all I need is a to be is to be equal to b to the two thirds, right? Uh, normally, when we're taking if we are squared, I will take a square root in each case. But in this case, instead of doing a square root, I'm just going to take it to the inverse power, which is something you would have learned how to do in a um, class before this one. So, anytime I want this b number. I just need to plug in a to the two thirds, or a to the, or sorry, um, I just need to plug in b to the two thirds, and that will give me the answer I want. Now, why am I saying all of this, right? Well, it's kind of to help some people maybe understand what's happening, but altogether, right, we start at three, right, and we get zero. Right, and each time we can get, keep getting bigger and bigger positive numbers. Right, obviously, if I plug in like negative five, I would get um, three minus negative five, which would give me eight times the square root of eight, which we don't know what exactly it is, but it keeps getting bigger and bigger and bigger. So we can actually see what our range is doing. Our range is going to be going towards. It's going to start at zero, right? Because it's zero, but it keeps getting bigger, so it'll go towards positive infinity as well. So it's a little bit of an ex inspection ex exercise, just trying to see what happens. Um, I, I won't, probably won't include like a little tag thing on here. Um, like, uh, it's on the study guide on the actual test, but 
um, you still want to be able to know what's happening because there are some examples in the homework that work like that. So, okay, cool. Hopefully that makes sense a little bit. Um, just, um, yeah, definitely just want to think over how the domain and range works. You also might just try to, you know, graph some points and see what the function is doing, right? Um, and that might help out. So well, what do we say at three? That we're going to get zero. And at two, we get one. And so the graph looks like it's doing something like this. And so that also tells you, oh, okay, well, I include zero and I include everything up from it. So, okay. Logan, do you have any questions for me so far? Or are you good? Okay, great, thank you. Hopefully that'll make sense. Um, I think I have another function problem in here. And so we'll get to do maybe a, another uh, sort of example of this in some way. I think it just talks about the domain, but um, anyway, let's move on to this next one. So we have two functions. So this is number two now. And we have f of x equals um, x squared plus one. And we have g of x is the square root of x. So we want to find f of f of x, g of um g of f of x and f of g of x so i wrote, wrote them a little out of order but we're going to find all of them regardless okay so and we're just asked to we want to find the domain of each okay so let's do one at a time right so we want to find f of f of x well this is the same thing as this is a composition so i write f of f of x, right? And f of x is our x squared plus one term. So I'm gonna do f of x squared plus one. Well, in this case, this is f of, or sorry, f in this case again is x squared plus one. So I'm gonna plug in x squared plus one in for x here. So I get x squared plus one squared plus one. Okay, this is a good chance to mention again. Um, I saw a lot of times on the quizzes that if I had, um, uh, when it came to um, the four step process, that if I was plugging in x plus delta x into f, right? Or even something like this, if I had x squared plus one, then it's tempting for people often to say, okay, well, I'll plug in x squared into x, and then I'm just going to throw the plus one on the side, right? But we don't, we can't do that, okay? If I'm saying f of x squared plus one, then I need to plug all of the x squared plus one into the x. So we get plus one here. x squared plus one squared is going to be x to the fourth power plus two x squared plus one. Again, that's so that's using Pascal's triangle, or that's just multiplying it out, whichever way you prefer, and then add one to it from here, okay? Which will leave us with x to the fourth plus two x squared plus two. Okay, so now what is the domain of this function? Well, the domain is simply, let me see. Here we go. Okay, the domain of this function, right? I mean, there's no, there's not really any trouble here, right? I didn't even bring the square root in yet. It's just x to the fourth plus two x squared plus two. I didn't take any square roots with, within here. So really I can plug whenever x I want. So the domain of this function is going to go from negative infinity to infinity. Good. Now let's come to g of f of x. So g of f of x is saying the same thing as g and then f of x is on the inside but we know f of x again is x squared plus one but g is the square root of x so i'm going to take x squared plus one and plug it into square root of x so i get the square root of x squared plus one and this would be the function 
So that one's even a little easier to evaluate because we can't do anything more with it. Remember, um, I'll write this over here just real quick. The square root of x squared plus one is not the same thing as the square root of x squared plus the square root of one. I'm not allowed to do that. If these two terms are summing, this is not the same thing, okay? Um, there may be one case where it's the same thing, but in general, it's not, right? Because clearly, um, let me think of a good example. Um, if I put two in, right? The square root of two squared plus one, which would be five, right? Is not the same thing as the square root of two squared four plus the square root of one, right? Because square root of five is not equal to two plus one, which is three, right? Three squared does not give me five, right? That doesn't make sense. So please, anytime you're working with powers, make sure if it's a square root, you can't take it. And if it's a binomial like this one is, you have to do the foiling. Okay, cool. So what is the domain of this function? Well, remember from the last problem that since we have a square root, I need whatever's inside the square root to be greater than or equal to zero. Okay, which means in this case that x squared is greater than or equal to minus one. Well, this is odd, right? I mean, this is always true, right? Because x squared, is a positive number, right? If you square anything, it's positive. So I have to say a positive number is greater than or equal to negative one. Well, of course. So this is always true. So in this case, there's no X that makes this, that breaks this, it always works, okay? So in this case, I'm gonna say that the domain is negative infinity to infinity. Again, okay, last one f of g of x. So again, we're going to write this as f and then g of x on the inside, which is the same thing as f of the square root of x, which is the same thing as the square root of x, right, plugged into x here, squared plus one, okay? Now, let's be careful, okay? I'm not going to take the square yet. And the reason being is because uh, this is this is still my function, right? I can might be able to simplify writing it, but this is what I have. Okay, can I plug in a negative number into this? No, I, I can't. That's impossible. I can't put negative one, negative two into this, right? So I still have to consider that square root in this case, right? I still need x to be greater than or equal to zero, right? Or otherwise this fails. That doesn't make sense, right? It's not a real a real value. Okay, so my domain is still going to be, or in this case, I can include zero, but then I have to go to positive infinity. However, right, any other number is fine, right? So then finally, I can just simplify that. And so the function is going to be x plus one. So this is f of g of x, but it has a very specific domain, right? It only, we can only plug in zero to infinity. I cannot plug in anything else. Okay. Good. Um, awesome. So these are that's all the parts of that question. Um, I'll go ahead and keep going. Um, Logan, feel free if um, if you have any questions to just stop me, um, and that's fine. So I'll keep watching the comments, or you can speak, use your audio. Okay. Cool. Oh, give me a one moment. I'll be right back. Oh, you're good. <laughs> okay, had to just make sure they put the clothes sign on. I'm at the Mac right now. So, okay, number three. We want to evaluate the following limit, which is the limit 
That's x approaches to of x squared minus four over an x cubed minus eight. Okay, so this is another good check, right? Um, like I said, these problems are harder um, than the ones that um, will be on the test, but this is the best practice um, possible for you guys. So um, we need to remember how to factor both of these, right? We've seen this top one plenty of times. This is just a difference in squares. So we're gonna have the limit as x approaches two of x plus two times x minus two. And now we need to remember how to factor x cubed minus eight, okay? You'll wanna kind of dig back in to try to find your formulas, right? But this actually factors into, let's see Aiden. Um, x minus two times x squared um, plus two x plus four. All right. So you can check this, right? Actually, I'll, I'll go ahead and check it real quick while I'm doing it. So I have x minus two, x squared plus two, x plus four. X times x, you get x cubed, x times two x, two x squared, x times four plus four x, minus two x squared, minus two, two x minus four x, minus two plus four is my, uh, minus eight. So notice all of these terms are gonna cancel out. And so this works. This comes from a, a couple of basic formulas, um, which you've probably have seen before at some point, um, but it's a good thing to remember. So um, if I'm taking, let's see, can we still see this? Anymore? So if I'm taking a cubed minus b cubed, I can rewrite this as a minus b times a squared plus ab plus b squared. And if I have a cubed plus b cubed, then I can rewrite this as a plus b times a squared minus a b plus b squared. So these are called the difference of cubes formulas or sum of cubes in this case. Okay, some good to maybe remember, um, but if you don't, that's okay. Um, but something good to try to practice to keep up on because it could pop up again at any point. So now that we're here, we can see that x minus two and x minus two will cancel, which will leave us with the limit as x approaches two of x plus two over x squared plus two x plus four, which is going to be plug two into the top and plug two into the bottom, right? Because I can plug it in now. I get four over four plus four plus four, four because two squared plus two times two plus four, we get four over 12, which is one third. So one third is the final answer. Okay, so just a little bit of factoring um, to get that to work, but um, that is the problem. Okay, and notice um, it is okay for us to factor the bottom as well. I think a lot of the examples I might have in class and maybe the book ones, maybe only factor the top, but if you need to factor both, that's okay. That's completely an option. Okay, let's erase this first. And then I'll erase this. And we'll move on to um, number four, which is the limit as x approaches infinity of one plus four x cubed over three x squared, uh, or sorry, three x cubed minus 12 x squared plus nine x. Okay, so um, what we want to do when we have these problems um, where we're take, going towards infinity, right? And we have kind of the top and bottom, we see the same power um, or just, I mean, any sort of power combination. So we want to try to divide by the highest power. Um, there are some cases where you don't necessarily have to do that, but I think um, that's kind of the basic principle to go with. So I'm going to divide by x cubed on the top and bottom. And I can do that because as long as I do the same thing to the top and bottom, it's still the same fraction, okay? But this is gonna give me the limit as x approaches infinity of one over x cubed plus four, right? Because one divided by x cubed, four x cubed divided by x cubed, all over three x cubed divided by x cubed, which is three minus, so I have x squared over x cubed, which is going to be just one X to left on the bottom. And then X over X cubed leaves two X's on the bottom. 
So I get nine over X squared. Okay. All right. So just to write that again for people. Um, so we had minus 12 X squared over X cubed. So this had two X's and this had three X's. So one X is left over. And this one was nine X over X cubed. This had one X, this had three X's. So one X gets taken from the top and bottom and we're left with this. So now when I take the limit of this, right? Every, because of the limit laws, right? And the constant uh, rules with that, um, all of these one over X terms, when I take them towards infinity, I can take the each one are gonna become zero. So I'm gonna get zero. And then all of just the numbers are just gonna stay the same. So I'm gonna get zero plus four over three minus 12 times zero plus nine times zero. Okay, but zero plus four is four and 12 times zero is zero, nine times zero is zero. So we're just left with three on the bottom, giving us a final answer of four thirds. Okay, on the test, please show this. I know that it's just the ratio of the coefficients and I've said that because I wanted to, it's, it's helpful to know that, but please show me your work. Okay, cool. Let's take a look at problem number five. Okay, so this is, um, I threw this problem in. Um, it wasn't necessarily one, I think that there was examples of in the limit section itself, um, but when you were doing the four-step process, you definitely would have come across something like this. Um, and so I wanted to have it as an example um, or a practice problem to really get you good at identifying this step. So we have the limit as T approaches um, minus one of the square root of t squared plus three minus two over t plus one. Okay. So whenever I'm solving this problem, right, um, we've worked with, and actually the next example is a problem like this, um, problems where I've had a square root of something squared minus something else, right? And the question becomes, well, what do I, how do I fix this? How do I work this out so I can actually do something with this, right? Because right now, this definitely just ends up being zero on the top and bottom. So the way, anytime you see a square root, your first, one of the first thoughts that should come to your head is, oh, and a limit, of course, um, is conjugate, right? Because um, if I could just square this term and square this term, that would help me potentially to solve my issues. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to multiply the top and bottom of this by the conjugate of this term, um, which is t squared plus three plus two. I just changed the sign in the middle, okay? Multiply by the same thing on the bottom, okay? Now what's gonna happen when I do that, right? I have this, this square, Square root's gonna cancel out. So I get the limit as t approaches minus one. So I have a denominator still. Um, I'm gonna have t squared plus three. Okay. And then what happens is, is I get plus two times the square root of t plus three and minus two times the square root of t plus three. Those two terms will cancel each other out. And then I'm just left with minus two times two, which is gives me minus four over t plus one times the square root of t squared plus three plus two, okay? If you'll permit me, I'm gonna go ahead and rewrite this t squared plus three minus four term as just t squared minus one, okay? And the reason I do that is because notice, this is a difference of squares. It's t squared minus one, right? And whenever I have a difference of squares, I can rewrite that as t plus one times t minus one, all over t plus one times the square root of t squared plus three plus two. Well, nicely, the t plus ones will cancel and I'm left with the limit 
as t approaches minus one of t minus one over the square root of t squared plus three plus two. Okay, now from here, I shouldn't have any issues plugging in. So let's do that. So I'm gonna get minus one plus, or sorry, minus one minus one over the square root of negative one squared plus three plus two. Which one would work that out? I get minus two on top over one. So this is the square root of, or sorry, negative one squared is one. One plus three is four. Square root of four is two. We get two plus two, which is negative two over four or minus one. Thus, minus one half is my final answer. Okay, so this is a little bit of a combination of this kind of square root conjugate problem and also doing a bit of factoring, right? Because we can see that these two terms are going to cancel out. It's helping us to actually do the problem. <clears throat> okay, left that up for a bit of time. This is number five. Okay, number six at this point should come to be a little bit easier, hopefully. Um, so I have the limit. as t approaches infinity of the square root. Oh, I did it. I wrote t from the last problem, x in this case, of 4x squared plus 5 minus 2x. OK. So how do I figure this out? Well, we have another square root with something squared minus something, right? You want to make sure you want to check, you know, this is x squared on the inside, but that square root makes it act a little bit more like, you know, an x term, right? Because the square root of x squared is something like x. So these are about the same, okay? Anytime I see something like this, I should be thinking conjugate. I need to do something with the conjugate, okay? So. <laughs> Or it, even just, uh, you know, obviously with most examples, it'll, we're going to end up, if you have a square root minus something plus something else, then I'm probably going to have to use a conjugate. But let's go ahead and do that here. So I'm going to multiply the top and bottom by the square root of 4x squared plus 5 um, plus 2x over the square root of 4x squared plus 5 plus 2x. And so this is going to give me the limit as x approaches infinity. As last time, we get this term squared. So we get 4x squared plus 5. And then 2x times 2x gives me minus 4x squared all over the square root of 4x squared plus 5 plus 2x. Well, the limit in this case becomes 4x squared minus 4x squared is 0. We're left with 5 over the square root of 4x squared plus 5 plus 2x. Now I have 5 over things with x's in it. So as I plug in infinity, this is only going to keep getting bigger and this does nothing. So what I can say at this point, just by inspection, or just think, like, thinking about it a little bit, is that this is going to approach 0. Okay, I have something that's not changing over something that's changing and getting really, really big. So at this point, at one point, this could look like 100, you know, something with a huge amount of zeros, right? And that's going to be so small that as we take the limit, as we go towards infinity, we're just going to call that thing zero. All right. Good. <laughs> um. So let's go ahead and move on to the next one. Done with limits. Let's do the four step process. So now uh, number seven is to, we have f of x is three x squared minus six x. So now I wanna find the derivative of this using the four step process. So step one of the four step process Use their numbers here. Number one of the four step process, right? 
I can write this as y equals f of x equals this thing, right? Um, and so what I'm going to do is I'm going to replace every y with y plus delta y. And I'm going to replace every x with x plus delta x. Giving us something like this, okay? Remember, let me repeat. I'm going to repeat this a couple of times, okay? The delta x, remember, it's delta x first. You put x plus delta x in here. The delta x does not go on the end. The delta x does not go all the way at the end. It's going inside of the parentheses with the x, okay? It's x plus delta x every time, okay? Inside the parentheses. Do not take it outside of the parentheses. We just say x plus delta x each time. Okay. <clears throat> Step two, I subtract y equals f of x from both sides. So if I subtract y equals f of x from both sides, I'm going to have delta y, because I subtracted y, is going to be 3 times x plus delta x squared minus 6 times x plus delta x minus f of x. But in this case, you don't just write f of x, right? Because we know what f of x is. f of x is that 3x squared minus 6x term. OK, before we move on to the next step, let's go ahead and do some simplification, right? So again, we could either appeal to um, Pascal's triangle, or we can, you can just FOIL this out. But this term is going to become 3 times x squared plus 2x delta x plus delta x squared minus 6 times x plus delta x. And then we still have that minus 3x squared minus 6x right there. Okay. Distributing my numbers, I'm going to get 3x squared, 3 times 2, plus 6x delta x, 3 times delta x squared, uh, minus 6 times x, minus 6 times delta x. And then this minus is going to go with both of these terms. So we get my, minus 3x squared, minus minus, plus 6x. OK. So we have a plus 3x squared and minus 3x squared. So those are both going to cancel each other. And we have a minus 6x and a plus 6x. And so those are also going to cancel each other. So we are left with 6x delta x plus 3 delta x squared minus 6 delta x. OK. So this is our simplification. Step three is we divide by delta x from both sides. So we get delta y over delta x equals, now remember, I can take delta x and divide it from each of these terms. And all three of these terms have a delta x in them. So if I divide 6x delta x by delta x, I'm just left with 6x. If I take one delta x away here, I'm left with 3 delta x. And if I divide delta x here, I'm just left with minus 6. Okay. Last step, make sure we can see it. Okay, number four, I need to take the limit as delta x approaches zero of delta y over delta x, which is the limit as delta x approaches zero of um, 6x plus 3 delta x minus 6. Delta x in this case is going to go to zero, right? Because of this limit, but nothing else is affected. The six X doesn't change and the minus six doesn't change because they don't have delta X's on them. So once this term becomes zero, we're left with six X minus six. And so that should be the final answer. Now, keep in mind, right? We know power rule. So we could have went back uh, we could have came from the beginning, right? And known that the derivative of this using power rule, 3x squared minus 6x. Oh, you can't see that. So the derivative of this using power rule would become, you'd take down the 2, right? 2 times 3 times x to the 2 minus 1 minus 6 times 1, right? Or this would just would turn into 6x minus 6, which is exactly what we want down here. 
but um, you need to do the four step process to know, like, don't just do that. That's good to check it, but don't do that for the work. We need to do the four step process here because it's specifically asked for. <laughs> okay. Good. So I will erase from top to bottom here and we'll move on to number eight. <coughs> Number eight, we're going to differentiate f of x is equal to five thirds x cubed minus two times the square root of x plus three. Okay, so remember. Um, that two times the square root of x, that square root of x is the same thing as x to the one half power. And that's gonna help us to do this problem because then it turns into five thirds x cubed minus two times x to the one half plus three. Well, we know from our power rule and our sum rule that we can just go to each term to find the derivative of this thing, right? So if I'm taking the derivative of the function, right? So the derivative of 5 thirds x cubed minus 2x to the 1 half plus 3, then this is the same thing as the derivative of 5 thirds x cubed, right? Plus the derivative of negative 2x to the 1 half plus the derivative of 3. And this one, right? We're just going to take the 3 and bring it down. So that's going to be 5 thirds times 3, which is 5, times x to the 3 minus 1, which is 2, so 5x squared. Okay. And then we have minus 2 times 1 half, which is minus 1, times, and then we get x to the 1 half minus 1. 1 half minus 1 is the same thing as 1 half minus 2 over 2, which is negative 1 half. So we have um, x to the minus 1 half. If you want to flip that down again, that's fine, um, using negative exponents. But if you don't, that's OK. Finally, we want to take the derivative of 3, which is simply 0. And so this is a perfectly acceptable final answer. If you wanted to skip this step, you could. Um, this is just to show we can split up to each term, uh, but that was just finding the derivative. Okay, good. Let's keep chugging along. So we want to find the equation for of the tangent line. Oh, how did I get the five x at the end again? How did I here? Um, well, I got that because. So I'm gonna make sure this is five here. Um, what happens, right? So remember, whenever I'm doing power rule, if I have the derivative of x to the n power, then I get n times x to the n minus one, okay? And also, um, if, I have, if I have a constant times a function when I'm taking the derivative, then it's simply the same thing as just the constant times the derivative of that function, okay? So in this case, what happens is, is for, if I'm taking the derivative of um, 5 thirds x cubed, what happens is, is I get, using this rule, this is the same thing as 5 thirds times the derivative of x cubed. The derivative of x cubed, we come to here, is the same thing as 5 thirds times, so the x cubed becomes 3 times x to the 3 minus 1, which is 2. Now, 5 thirds times 3 is just 5, right? Because the two 3s cancel each other out. So that's how I end up with 5x squared. Not just 5x, 5x squared. Okay. Yeah, no problem. Awesome. Good, good, good. Okay. And then I did a similar thing for here as well. 
for the, the one half power. Okay. The next one is, um, so it says find the equation of the tangent line to the curve y equals three halves x um, plus x to the three halves okay. <clears throat> at the last symbol here one five thirds. Okay, so we want to find the equation to the tangent line at this curve, and this is number nine. Okay, so the way to do this, right, is well, first, we may think, okay, um, I mean, there's a few things to think here. It says tangent line, right? So whenever we're thinking of tangent line, right, um, what we should be thinking about, right, is that should kind of think about the definition of the derivative, right? Because the derivative is fine, is defined, sorry, as the slope of the tangent line at a given point, right? That is what a derivative is, right? Second, I'm thinking about a line, right? There's two things I need for a line. So for a line, I need one, slope, and two, point. Okay, this one is taken care of. Good, we were already given that. The slope part still needs to be taken care of. So how do I work this out? Well, to find the slope of the tangent line, right? Again, that's what the derivative is. The derivative is defined as the slope of the tangent line at a given point on my curve. So to find the slope of this line at this point, I need to take the derivative of my function, which we can do that. It's going to use power rule just like the last question, right? So again, um, I have three halves times x. So that constant can kind of hang out. And the derivative of x is just one. So I'm left with three halves or three halves times one if you want to see where that x is, but it's just three halves, OK? x to the three halves becomes, I take the derivative of that. So I bring the power down to the front, which will become three halves times x, and then three halves minus one is one half. So I get three halves x to the one half. Okay, so this is my derivative, okay? So again, um, I took the derivative of this, which is just the constant stays the same, derivative of x becomes one, and then x to the three halves, the derivative of the three halves comes down in front, and then x to the three halves minus one. But three halves minus one is simply one half. Okay, because you can subtract two over two and get one half. Okay, now I need the slope at this point. So if this derivative, so I can rewrite this as three halves plus three halves x um, to the one half. I need it at x equals one. So I use the x point, okay? So I'm gonna write dy over dx um, at one, right? So I'll maybe I'll put that one, you know, put a one here, is equal to three halves plus three halves times one to the one half. Well, what's one to the one half? That's the same thing as the square root of one, which is just one. So this is gonna give me three halves plus three halves, which is six over two, which is three. So this is the slope I need of my line. The slope is three and my point is one five thirds. Okay, to finish the final part of this question, I just need to take my slope and my point and plug it into uh, the equation of a line. So you can either use slope intercept form, um, which I'm sure most of you are familiar with, or you may also remember point slope form, 
which says that y minus y1 equals m times x minus x1. So if I know my slope and I know a point, I just plug it into this formula and it'll give me the equation of my line I want, okay? So I take my point, which is x1, y1, 1, 5 thirds, and I plug it in. So y minus 5 thirds, and I also plug in my m, which m in this case is going to be 3 times x minus 1. But I can simplify this to say, um, we'll take this down a little more. Okay, y minus 5 thirds equals 3x minus 3, adding 5 thirds to both sides. This is going to give me y equals 3x, and then I have minus 3, which is the same thing. So we're wanting to do minus 3, I'll write it up here, um, plus 5 thirds, which is the same thing as negative 9 over 3 plus 5 over 3. Nine, negative nine plus five is minus four. So we're left with minus four thirds. So the line is y equals three x minus four thirds. So that is the slope of the tangent line or the equation of the tangent line to the curve at that point. If I just ask for the slope of the tangent line at that point, then all you need to answer is this. But if I ask for a whole equation, I need to see the equation of this line. Okay. Cool. So definitely know how to do this. Um, I put a couple of examples on the study guide like this. Um, and of course, in the homework as well, um, we do need to know kind of to recognize the language. We need to understand what the derivative means. Okay. Good. So I don't mind. Uh, I'm willing to go as long as need to. I'm gonna I want to kind of finish running through all these problems, I think. Not too kind of more than halfway through since we're skipping a, a few of them. Um, let's go ahead and do number 10. Okay, so now we're just doing some derivatives, right? So so number 10 says um, we have h of z equals z over z plus one to the third power. Okay, so um, if you don't necessarily wanna do it the way it, like how it looks right now, um, then you could easily rewrite this as take that third power to the top and bottom. I'll get z cubed over z plus one to the third power, okay? So maybe this might be easier for some people, okay? Um, I'm gonna take the derivative of the thing just as it is, okay? Um, so you can rewrite it like this, and that'll just be a straight, straight kind of quotient rule problem. Um, or if you want to, remember that I can always use negative exponents to bring something up from a denominator. So I could rewrite this as z cubed times z, sorry, <laughs> plus one to the negative third power. This is true um, as that negative three would just bring it back down. So this is the same equation. So in this case, I could just use product rule if I wanted to, okay? So there's a few options. Um, I always like to just, you know, start out with, I would just use whatever option seems the most clear. Um, there could always be some simplification to be done, um, but, we can start out this just with, um, I'm just gonna do the derivative as is, but feel free to try these out as well. So this would be quotient rule, and this would be product rule. This is gonna use some quotient rule, um, but we are, uh, the main rule I wanna highlight here is the chain rule. And the chain rule says that, right? Uh, remembering from class that if I'm taking the derivative, if I have, um, a function of like if y is a function of u, okay? So this is, remember, u will say is g of x. So I'm taking f of u. So this is like a composition from earlier, right? So I have a function inside of another function. How I take the derivative of this is if I'm finding the derivative of y with respect to x, okay? 
then this is the same thing as taking the derivative of y first with respect to u, right? So I just treat that thing on the inside as a variable of sorts or like see it as a variable inside there. But then I need to multiply this by, right? I want to get the dx. So I want to cancel out that du and I'm going to divide by this dx. So now the du's would cancel out and I'm left with the i over dx again. So anytime I have a situation like this to find the derivative, I take the derivative of the outside portion essentially and then multiply by the derivative of the inside portion, okay? As a quick example, before we get to the exact one we're doing, right? We talked about the general power rule in class. Um, I probably should have left that up, but um, let me write that real quick again. So dy over dx is dy over du plus, or sorry, times du over dx. So this is chain rule right here. Okay, we also learned in class the general power rule, which says that the derivative of u to the n power, where u is a function, is n times u to the n minus one times the derivative of u with respect to x, which looks just like this, right? Because I'm treating first the function as a function of u, right? So I bring the n down, u to the n minus one. And I took the derivative of this. But then I just need to multiply it by du over dx. Okay, so just as a quick example, um, if I'm taking the derivative of 2x squared plus 1 to the third power, what's going to happen is I'm going to look on the outside as a function first. Okay, so this whole thing, I'm going to kind of consider it as my u. Okay, so right now I'm looking at u cubed. And so when I take the derivative of u cubed first, I need to bring that 3 down times u, which in this case is 2x squared plus 1. Okay, to the second power. Okay, so I just did the derivative of u cubed. But that's just the dy over du part, or the nu to the n minus one part in this case. I need to multiply this by du over dx. So I need to multiply the n by the derivative of the thing on the inside to make this correct, to make this statement true. So the derivative of u, right? u is 2x squared plus one. The derivative of u is. 2 times 2 times x, which is just 4x, okay? Remember, the derivative of 2x squared is the derivative of 2 times the derivative of x squared, which would be 2 times 2. So it's 2 times 2x, which would be 4x, okay? Also, the derivative of 1 is just 0. So we are left with just 4x. And so this would be the final answer in this case. If you wanted to multiply things together, you could, um, but you don't have to. So. How does this pertain to the actual problem that we have? Well, I'll leave the example up real quick. Um, and the basic chain rule here. The derivative with respect to z in this case of z over z plus one to the third power, I'm gonna do the same thing. So I'm gonna treat that thing on the inside as my u in this case. So the derivative of u cubed, again, is three times u, which is z over z plus one, to the second power. And then I multiply by the derivative of the inside, right? Now we need to figure out, well, what, the, what is the derivative of the inside part? Well, this is where we need to use quotient rule, right? Quotient rule, well, I'll remove the example now, says that, so this is, so this is chain, I'll just write chain, and then this is quotient. Quotient rule says that if I'm taking the derivative of u over v, then this is the same thing as v times du over dx minus u times dv over dx over v squared. So applying that to this case, if u, so we're going to let u be z and v be z plus 1. Well, what's the derivative of u with respect to the variable, which in this case is z? It's just the number one. Same thing, the derivative of v with respect to z is also one. 
So if I think about plugging this into the formula, right? I see that Z over Z plus one is going to be V, which is Z plus one times D over DZ, which is one minus the top, or sorry, minus U, which is Z times the derivative of the bottom, which is one over Z plus one squared. But I basically on the top get Z plus one minus Z. So the Z's cancel out and I'm left with negative one over Z plus one all squared. Good. So this gets multiplied on the outside of this. So I get times negative one over Z plus one. And so that is my final answer. Okay. Um, it says my connection is unstable. Um, we're gonna, I'm gonna make sure that's good. I'll let this soak for a little bit. Um, for Logan, of course, anybody else who's watching the recording later, I'm gonna plug in my computer and make sure everything's good. Okay. <clears throat> Good. Now, let me see the next question. Okay, this is actually, the next question is actually an easier example of the quotient rule. Um, <clears throat> so I'm going to leave the quotient rule written. And we're going to talk about the next problem. So again, if you would prefer, so this is, this problem says you, um, let's see, uh, u minus five over u squared minus two u plus three. Okay, so again, if you want to, this would be fine. I can take this and rewrite it as u minus five times u squared minus two u plus three to the minus one. Because this is still right, right? That this is the same thing, this is to the first power essentially. And so if I bring it up, I can rewrite it as a negative exponent. And then you can use product rule. Um, I'm gonna have a clear example of product rule um, in the next problem um, where I say to differentiate using the product rule. Um, but um, you can definitely do that here if you're comfortable with that. There will be chain rule involved in this example, but um, there's a preference. However, here, we're gonna use a uh, quotient rule again, because um, this is a rule that's probably one of the hardest ones to remember. So the derivative of G, so I'm gonna say DG over D, U in this case, Right, we're gonna use quotient rule. So quotient rule says that I take, so actually let's let's write out our terms first, right? So in this case, I'm using U, I get a little weird. Let's maybe let's consider, let's write U as W now. Okay, so I'm gonna use W instead. Again, these are just dummy variables. It doesn't matter what you use, just use kind of whatever you remember, um, but this is trying to stick as close to what the book uses. So. Um, we'll say W in this case is U minus five. So V is U squared minus two U plus three. So DW over DU, so the derivative of W, which is what we need, right, is going to be one because the derivative of U of just the variable by itself is one and the derivative of the number is zero. The derivative of V with respect to U, the derivative of U squared becomes two U the derivative of negative two u is minus two, right? Because the u just becomes one and then the three becomes zero. So we have one and we have two u minus two. Okay, so I'll turn this slightly. Now we can do dg over du. And this is going to be v, which is u squared minus two u plus three times the derivative of W, which is one, 
minus w, which is u minus five, times the derivative of v, as two u minus two, all over v, which is u squared minus two u plus three squared. And I will accept this as a final answer. Feel free to simplify if you'd like. Um, things might be able to cancel out a little bit um, or be written more simply, um, but I don't, that won't require it. Okay. okay, let me get the next one up. Okay, let that one sink in. Okay, next one, it says specifically to differentiate using the product rule. So I'll go ahead and leave the solution up there for anybody who needs it. Um, but the next problem says y equals 5x cubed minus 3x times 1 over 2x squared minus 1. OK, so we want to differentiate this specifically using the product rule. Okay, product rule, if we remember, says that if I'm taking the derivative of u times v, then this is the same thing as u times dv over dx plus v times du over dx. Okay, so in this case, let's label our terms, right? We will have u as the left term, which is 5x cubed minus 3x. And we have v as 1 over 2x squared minus 1. But if you'll permit me, I'm going to rewrite this 2x squared on the bottom. I'm going to rewrite that x squared with a negative exponent. So I'm going to rewrite this as 1 half x to the negative second power minus 1. Right? If you're catching on, um, it's really good to know negative exponents because that'll make this work a little bit easier as you're going through. <sighs> okay, so from here, I'm gonna plug, I, oh, actually, I still need to find dv and du, right? So du over dx, right? Again, we need to use product rule, which says that I take five times three, which is 15 x squared, leave, I have a minus three, derivative of x is just one, and then dv, over dx is going to be, I take the minus two, multiply it down with the one half, minus x to the negative two minus one, right? Negative two minus one, not plus one, minus one. And then the minus one just becomes zero, but this is gonna become negative x to the negative third power, which is the same thing as negative one over x. You can leave it like this if you want, that's fine. Um, since this isn't the final answer yet, I like to, Rewrite it beforehand just in case. Okay, so now we just plug everything in, right? So I'm gonna plug in 5x cubed minus 3x, 1 over 2x squared minus 1, 15x squared minus 3, and minus 1 over x cubed. So the derivative, so dy over dx in this case is going to be u, which is 5x cubed minus 3x times dv over dx, which is that minus times minus one over x cubed plus v, which is one over two x squared minus one times du over dx, times du over dx, okay? So which is gonna be that 15 x squared minus three. And this is our final answer. Okay, again, if I, you could have um, multiplied it out and then did a derivative, but since I specifically asked for product rule, um, I advise you to use product rule so you can know it. Okay, let's see. We have four more problems to run through. So let's do it. Okay, four more that I can do, at least for now that I've taught. Okay. Um, find the equation of the tangent line. 
Okay, so I'll leave the final answer again. I'm gonna erase everything beforehand. Okay. <clears throat> so number 13 says, find the equation of the tangent line to the curve y equals the square root of three plus x plus the square root of x at well, four, three. I guess I have three of these problems. Interesting, okay. So let's, before we do anything, right? This is just like the other one, right? Where we have need the equation of the tangent line. So we need two things. We need slope and we need um, a point. We have the point, it's right here, but we need the slope still. And to get the slope, oh, that's completely fine, Logan. Um, I'm gonna continue recording this so you can feel free to watch the rest of it after. So. Thank you. Okay, it's just me, great. Anyway, um, continuing on. Um, we need to find the slope, right? So I'm gonna take the derivative of y. So I get dy over dx, right? Now, actually, before we do that, let's rewrite y as Right with um, the one half power, right? That'll make it a little bit easier to work with. So I'm gonna have three plus x plus, I'm gonna write that square root of x as x to the one half, and then do a one half on the outside, right? Maybe that'll make it easier to see. It's a little weird with the square roots on the inside, but we'll, we'll kind of get it all figured out, okay? So let's take the derivative of this thing, okay? So this is another example of chain rule, right? Which chain rule says that I need to take the power, right? So I'm gonna I'm gonna consider the whole, everything on the inside is like u in this case. So it's um, yeah. So everything is I'm gonna call it u for now, okay? So I have u u to the one half power right now, right? So if I'm taking the derivative of that, I'm gonna treat it as something to the one half. So that one half is gonna to come to the front and then times u to the minus one half. And then I'm gonna multiply this by the derivative of u, right, du over dx. But in this case, u is, um, you know, the three plus x plus x to the one half. Um, and to make plugging in the number easier, remember that negative one half can be brought down to the bottom. So I'm gonna have, three plus x plus x to the one half to the positive one half on the bottom, okay? And then what's the derivative of the inside? Well, the derivative of u is derivative of three, which is zero, plus the derivative of x, which is one, plus the derivative of x to the one half, which is one half x to the minus one half, okay? So this is my derivative, okay? And again, if we want to, um, this answer. I can rewrite this as one over two. So three plus x plus x to the one half to the one half. I can move that negative exponent on the inside of this parentheses here um, down to the bottom. So I get one over two times x to the one half, okay? So this is my derivative. It looks a little complicated, right? Um, if it, you want to make it easier to see, um, if, if you want to plug into this, just fine. Um, again, we have to plug in that four up there. So maybe we'll rewrite it easier, right? All those one halves can just become square roots again, right? So I'm going to rewrite this as one over two times the square root of three plus X plus the square root of X times one plus one over two times the square root of X. And we get that. Okay, now what is dy over dx at the number four? Well, I'm gonna have one over two times the square root of three plus four plus the square root of four times one plus one over two times the square root of four. Okay, we have a little bit of calculation here. So let's work that out, right? 
So here I have one hat, so one over two. So we have three plus four, which is seven. The square root of four is two. Seven plus two is nine. What's the square root of nine? Three. Square root of four is two. Two times two is four. So I get one plus one over four. Okay. So maybe let's combine what's in here, right? So right now I have one over six times one is the same thing as four over four plus one over four. So four plus one is five. So we get one six times five over four, which is the same thing as five over. <laughs> Not the nicest number. Um, and like I said, you won't have one. Um, I won't make you do one that's this difficult kind of computation wise on um, the actual quiz, unless it be a bonus problem. Um, but please um, understand what's happening. Okay. Remember, we're using chain rule. So I kind of have, you know, what's what happened here, right? So we had, because um, we did the derivative of the outside part. So I took the one half times u to the minus one half and then multiplied by the derivative of the inside. So it gets a little messy. You have negative powers and the square roots. But in the end, um, it'll turn into something nice. Um, I did make it so at least it's a, it's a good number. Okay, so now again, we need to use point slope form. So I'm gonna use point slope, which says that y minus y1 equals m times x minus x1, but y1 is uh, three, m is five over 24, and x minus four. Okay, so we get y minus three is equal to five twenty-fourths x. Four over twenty-four, right? Twenty-four divided by four is six, right? But basically, there's six, six fours, or that's not the best way to think about it. Um, four times six is twenty-four. Right, so if I divide that four away on the top and bottom, I'm left with just a six on the bottom. So I get five six. Okay, please review that and make sure you know how to do that multiplication. Um, and then if I add three to both sides, I get y equals five over twenty four x minus five six plus three. Three is the same. So we have minus five six plus three, which is the same thing as as I'll write down here, negative five over six plus 18 over six, which is 13 over six. So we get 13 six. And so that would be the final answer. Okay, so some messy numbers, um, but I think this is, even though it's a difficult example, it's a really good example of the sort of, of the kind of the, this tangent line problem. Okay, good. So we're almost there. Let's see. Um, good, so we have neurasis. Okay, so number 14 has a little bit of writing there, right? So number 14, but um, it's not too bad, right? So it says a toaster has an initial velocity of 12 meters per second. Um, and has a height represented by h, which is equal to 12t minus 4.91t squared. Okay, so um, that 12 just factors in here, right? You see it here. Um, it doesn't really do anything besides that. Okay, it says, so their first question is, what is the toaster's velocity after two seconds? Okay, well, in this case, even though in class we said S, right? We were using S as our position. H still gives a position of sorts, right? So if I want to find the velocity, I just take the derivative of, of, the, of H. So I'm going to find dH over dt, which is going to be V, which is the same thing as the derivative of 12T just gives me 12 minus, and then 4.91 times two is about, um, let's see, um, 
4.91 times 2. 9.82. Okay, if you don't get that exact, that's fine. Um, if I gave you a number like that again on the quiz, it would look, it would be a bit nicer, but uh, this is what we get for this problem, right? Um, so what is the velocity after two seconds? Well, to find that, right? So we have V of T equals 12 minus 9.82 T. So V of two is gonna simply be 12 minus 9.82 times two, which is, which is gonna be, you can kind of calculate it out. If you wanna do it by hand, that's great. Um, I'm, I'm going to use a calculator for now just so I can uh, kind of get this done here. But I'm going to get minus 7.64. Okay. And in this case, the units of the problem were given to be meters per second. So our velocity at that time is at time two is going to be 7.6, negative 7.64 meters per second. Okay. The second question is when is the toaster at rest? Well, um, the toaster at rest is at rest, right? Remember, whenever there's no velocity, right? So that's whenever the velocity is zero. So this is V of two question. This is, we want V equals zero now, right? For rest. So I'm gonna say 12 minus 9.82 T equals zero. So solving this, I get 9.82 T equals 12. Right, I just added 9.82 to both sides of the equation. So I get 9.82 T equals 12. Dividing by 9.82 on both sides. I get T is going to be 12 over 9.82, which um, is going to be something close to probably um, uh, 1.16 ish. Um, as long as you did the division part right and know what you're looking for, then that's all I care about. But this will be in seconds, right? So 1.16 seconds. Okay. Um, when will the toaster hit the ground, right? So now what is that a question? Are we finding zero velo the velocity at zero? When it's zero? No. I want to know when it hits the ground. So I want my height to be zero. So to find that, I'm going to take h and set it equal to zero, right? So I'm going to take 12t minus 4.91t squared and set it equal to zero. Now, these both have a t in common, right, at least. So I'm going to factor that out, right, because this is a quadratic. You always want to try to factor. We can complete the square, or you can use quadratic formula. Um, but in this case, we can factor nicely. I can pull t out and I have 12 minus 4.91 t. <coughs> so this tells me that either t equals zero, which that's where I start at, so we don't want that one, or 12 minus 4.91 t equals zero. Well, I can easily solve that just like I did this equation down here and add 4.91 t to both sides which will give me that 4.91. Sorry, if I think you understand what's going on there though, at least, but I'll make it bigger just in case. And, okay, 4.91 T equals 12. So that tells me that T is gonna be 12 over 4.91. Okay, and that's second. So whatever that number ends up being, that'll be the time whenever um, it hits the ground. Again. Okay, good. <laughs> okay. So, um, and it asks, what is the acceleration of the toaster? Well, so now we want acceleration, right? So velocity, right, is 12 minus 9.81 T. Remember that acceleration is simply the derivative of the velocity, right? So to find A, I just need to do dv over dt, which in this case, the derivative of 12 is zero. The derivative of negative 9.81 times t, right? That t is gonna drop or, it's, or it becomes one, right? The derivative of t is one. So we are just left with negative 9.81. So this is the acceleration. Or sorry, it was 9.82, wasn't it? Uh, 9.82, 9.82. 
So dV over dt in this case ends up being 9.8. Okay, and the units of that is going to be meters per second. Cool. Okay, so um, that's all the parts of that, right? Um, so we have our different times that we need, which I'll circle this as well, just to make sure we know that those are important. Um, <coughs> we have our four different answers. Okay. So you want to be able to know what we're looking for and how exactly to get it, right? And notice um, that acceleration is going to be constant throughout this whole thing. This is actually the acceleration of gravity. So this is very much like a real world, real world problem in this case. Okay. <laughs> Two more to do. Um, I plan to, I want to spend some time hopefully on Monday at the end and cover problems uh, 16 through 18, if possible. I would love to do that. Um, but in the meantime, I'm just going to cover these last two. So number 15, all right, for us, says um, that we, I want to, so I, I just had a silly scenario um, attached to this um, for a reasoning, but you don't really need to pay attention to the most of that. Um, uh, the balloons each have a volume of four thirds pi r cubed, where r is this radius of the balloon, okay? As I inflate these balloons, right? What is the rate of change of the volume at these different times, right? And it says with respect to the radius, right? So whenever we see rate of change, we need to think derivative. Derivative is what I want, right? So I need to take the derivative of V with respect to R. Well, four thirds pi is just a constant, right? So I could just keep that on the outside as I'm doing my work. And then I take the derivative of R to the third power, which we use power rule in that case, that R to the third power, what's gonna happen is I'm gonna multiply the three down, right? So this is times three and then R, and then to the three minus one, which is two. So we get three R squared. Notice that three times, we have three divided by three, so the threes go away. So we're left with four pi r squared. Good. So then the question is, um, <coughs> what is the rate of change when r is one centimeter? Well, this is already in centimeters, right? I can keep this in centimeters, right? So all that's going to happen, right, is I just plug in one. So I get four pi times one squared, which is four pi. So, and this is centimeters, um, four pi centimeters. Well, it's a, it's a little, the units are a little weird. Um, Cause technically in this case, right? Volume is centimeters cubed and radius is centimeter. So essentially what this is saying is that for every one centimeter, I get three, I get four pi centimeters cubed, okay? If I do, so this is dV over dr at one centimeter, okay? Um, for completeness, I'll go ahead and do the other two um, numbers as well. So dV over dr of five centimeters is gonna be four pi times five squared. So this is gonna be 25 times four is 100. So we get 100 pi centimeters cubed per centimeter. So notice that rate's getting pretty big, right? And especially if I go to 10 centimeters, I get four pi times 10 squared, which is 100 times four, which is 400 pi. And then that's gonna be centimeters cubed per centimeter. And so those are the rates in each case, right? But all you had to do in this example was find the derivative and then plug in numbers. Just like kind of on the, if I, on the tangent line question, so if I just asked for the slope, it'd be the same sort of thing. You just plug in numbers into the derivative. Okay. 
Again, I will have to skip 16, 17, and 18, um, but if you want to look ahead and try to practice those on your own, feel free to do so. Um, but I'm going to go to number 19. Number 19. I'll go ahead and say right now, I'll stand up for this one, um, just in case I need more room. <laughs> um, it's going to be maybe something like what the bonus question is asking. So if you want to be able to get the bonus points, this might be something good to pay attention to. So number 19, um, I guess if you don't care about the bonus points and you don't have to learn this one, but um, it will be beneficial. So I, I would encourage you to. So um, we're gonna find the limit if it exists. If it does not exist, explain why. So I'm gonna take the limit as X approaches one of the absolute value of X minus one over x minus one. Okay. So this function, it's a little hard to tell what exactly um, it's doing, right? But remember, right, the question specifically, I'm not just saying for you to evaluate the limit. I want you to tell me if the limit exists, right? So in order to tell me if the limit exists, we got to remember something, right? I talked about this. Right, and that, and what that is, is that <coughs> if I take the limit, the limit exists if the if the left hand limits limit and right hand limit exist and are equal to each other. Ah, so the limit of this function is going to exist if if left hand limits and right hand limits exist, which is easier to find generally, and if they're equal to each other. So let's look at the left hand and right hand limits of this thing, right? I mean, that's typically what we would kind of want to do with a absolute value, right? Um, we kind of want to see what's what's going on with it, right? What's uh maybe look at both sides as we're coming in. Okay. So <laughs> let's do both. Okay. So first. Um, maybe I can, I'll sit down now. <laughs> um, first, I'm going to take the limit as X approaches one from the right side of the absolute value of X minus one over X minus one. Okay. So, okay, actually, let me mention real quick, just to make sure. Um, since this is inside an absolute value, I cannot just directly divide these two things. Okay, it may be tempting to do that, right? But then you have, um, you'll just have like <coughs> one left over um, on the, and it, and that isn't quite right, okay? So we have to do something with it first before we could ever divide anything, okay? So you can't divide it. But let's, let's think about this, right? I'm taking the limit as X approaches one from the right side. What's going on with the numbers in here? as X approaches one from the right side. Are they positive, are they negative, right? What do we think, right? So we're plugging in two, 1.5, 1.1. Those are all bigger than one, right? So if I subtract one from them, it's bigger than one or it's bigger than zero, right? So this, it's gonna be positive. What's the absolute value of a positive number? Well, it's that number, right? So we get the limit as x approaches one from the right side of <coughs> x minus one over x minus one. So maybe explain a bit more what I mean, right? Whenever we talk about the absolute value function, right? Um, this just takes whatever the number is and makes it positive if it's not already, right? So I can rewrite this as a piecewise function. Hey, there's a lot of stuff coming in here, right? That's what, I, what we like with, with uh, 
fun problems like these. Okay. The absolute value of x I can rewrite as a piecewise function. Okay. <laughs> I'll take it into two parts. The first part is going to be x. Okay. And this will be whenever x is greater than or equal to zero. Why is that? Well, if x is greater than or equal to zero, what's the absolute value of that number? Well, it's just that number. So if, if x is greater than or equal to zero, it's just going to be whatever the number is, which in this case is x. Okay. What about when x is less than zero? Well, the number is negative, right? But we want to make it positive. So all I need to do is just attach a minus sign on it. Okay. So the absolute value of x is the same thing as this, right? So whenever x is greater than or equal to zero inside the absolute value, I just get whatever's on the inside. And whenever x is less than zero, I get negative x. Okay? So <coughs> if I have the limit as x approaches one from the right side of x minus of the absolute value of x minus one over x minus one, I'm dealing with positive values. So I just get whatever's on the inside, x minus one. But now I can just divide those two things, right? So this is the same thing as the limit as x approaches one from the right side of one, which is just the number one. Okay, if I just have the limit of a number, it's just that number. Okay. <laughs> now let's consider the limit as x approaches one from the left of the absolute value of x minus one over x minus one. Well, now the numbers inside the absolute value are negative, right? Because if I'm plugging in one from the left side, I'm plugging in 0, 0 0.5, 0 0.9. Those numbers minus one are going to be negative. So they're going to take on that negative sign because they're less than zero, right? The, uh, the number inside the absolute value is going to be less than zero. So I can rewrite this as the limit as x approaches one from the left side of negative x minus one over x minus one. One from one. Okay. Notice that the x minus ones are going to cancel out, right? So x minus one cancels with x minus one, and we have this negative left over. So I get the limit as x approaches one from the left side of minus one, right? Because this divided by this just leaves me with one, but I have the minus now. So what's the limit of this thing? It's just minus one. What's wrong? We said the limit exists if they exist, which they do, and are equal to each other. Is negative one equal to one? No. These are not equal to each other. So what does that mean for our original limit? It doesn't exist. Okay, great. Um, well, thank you guys um, for watching this video. Um, I'm hoping more people will as I post this. Um, yeah, I, um, once again, um, if, if you don't completely understand this example, I would encourage you to think about it. Um, but, you know, we didn't, none of our homework problems were too much like this. Um, this is just really a one to make you think a little bit. Um, to help you understand the concepts a bit more of what's happening. Um, but I hope this is helpful. Um, I did it going a little longer than I expected to, um, but that's okay. Um, I hope that this helps out. I just really want you all to be able to, I want you to be able to have everything you can to perform well um, on this test. So I would just appreciate it if you all took the time to um, kind of learn it and understand it and work through it. Um, Look forward to see you all um, on Monday. Um, so we can go through the last few problems and, and uh, talk about the last couple of sections. So um, really have this stuff down beforehand. Um, just make sure you know it. Yeah, uh, I think that's all I have to say. Um, I Like I said, um, I want to do this regularly. Um, Right now, I only had one person um, on Zoom. So if you want um, 
this to become a regular thing. Um, I would like to know that more people would come. Um, the class I originally thought I had um, is no longer happening, so I could potentially do it earlier on Fridays. Um, but really, I um, Fridays are the only day that I would really have to do something like this um, and be able to have the time and kind of the space to do it. But yes, and I'm sure it's the same for many of you with classes and all that. Yes, just let me know. Um, I want to continue to do this, um, but if we don't have too many, um, then we won't. Uh, Logan, I appreciate you're here. Um, I know that people couldn't make it, so I'm not saying how I, I'm not um, saying that it's a problem that nobody else is here because I'm happy to report it. Uh, I'm just saying that I want to know if it's, I would like to have people here to be able to ask questions and work through it with them. Um, and so if it's not, if that, that's not going to work out, then I'd like to know like what the next step might be to figure out something. So anyway, thank you guys. Um, have a wonderful weekend um, or, you know, hope it's going well whenever you're watching this and uh, thank you again. Have a wonderful day.